you. Morning. How was even yesterday? Good. Good. Why are we still low on energy? How was even yesterday? Good. Awesome. Yeah. Amazing. So, <clears throat> my name is Nish and I am a senior PM on the Xamarin team at Microsoft. I joined Xamarin when we were just 60 people. Okay, we used to know everyone's faces um, and it was amazing. So, <clears throat> uh, last, I think uh, every, I, I work on the evangelism team, so my main job was to talk about Xamarin and I was specifically focused on this region, Asia Pacific, so I have met a couple of you. I have known faces, I have great friends here, it's amazing. But every time I come this side of the world, one question that always gets asked, why is Xamarin so expensive, right? This was one question I would not have answer to. And last year, the problem was solved because Microsoft bought all your licenses, right? We got acquired. So that is fantastic. Now, I want to give you a little brief of the history of Xamarin because yesterday um, uh, we had a good history about Hockey App and how the founding and other things. But I want to go a little deeper in the Xamarin side of things because uh, Ben wanted me to share the story with you. So uh, it was in 2001, 2002 when the .NET framework was born. Right? That's the time when Miguel de Casa looked at it and said, like, hey, this is something which is great for Linux as well. So he ported the .NET framework onto Linux. And that's when the Mono was born. Mono is basically uh, the Spanish name for monkey. Okay? So that was Mono, which is basically .NET on Linux. So this was founded by Nat and Miguel in a company called Zimian, which was uh, derived from a monkey species called Simian. Okay? So you see all the monkeys around, the monkey fest, the monkeys, you know, now you can connect what monkeys are, right? Now, <clears throat> so what happened was like after a couple of years at Simeon, uh, Novell acquired Zimian. Did I say Simeon? It's Zimian, sorry. So Novell acquired Zimian and for 10 years, uh, Mono was getting matured over there. So we have Sushi over here who has been working uh, on the Novell team at Mono. He has more than 10 years experience there, right? So he can tell you more about what was the story in Novell. So <clears throat> Mono Droid and Mono Touch was born. Mono Touch was basically the, uh, the iOS port of taking the .NET to the iOS. And similarly, Android was the, uh, mono, it's called the Mono Droid. And uh, after, I think it was in 2011, yeah, it was in 2011 when uh, Mono got acquired by Attachmate. No, sorry, Novell got acquired by Attachmate. And that's the time when the entire uh, was, uh, the Mono team came out of Novell and formed a company called Xamarin. Okay? And Xamarin is also derived from a monkey species called Tamarin. Okay? So that's all the monkeys. So. <clears throat> Eventually, um, last year, you know what happened. So Microsoft acquired us. So that, those are the acquisition stories of uh, Xamarin. And it's been pretty exciting for the entire community as a whole. Now you have great time building apps on any platform, anywhere. Even though .NET is open source, right? The .NET Core and things. So it's, it's really amazing. It's no better time uh, to be a .NET developer now. Right? It's really amazing there. So <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'm just losing the trace of thought now. So uh, yeah, our team actually basically works, uh, are, are responsible for the Visual Studio on Mac. So basically that's the, the world's best ID, should I say that, or the best ID on the planet. Uh, how many of you are Visual Studio developers here? Okay, that's excellent. So every beautiful thing that's on Visual Studio uh, is now available on Mac. Well, <clears throat> when I talk about Mac uh, applications on Mac, it was not thought about taking everything, everything that you do on a Mac, every platform that you work on a, on, a, on a Windows to Mac. The way we looked at it is like, what would, as a Mac developer, would build on, uh, on a Mac? So that's, that's the idea behind, that's the philosophy behind it. So that's where we, we let you build iOS apps, you can build some great games, you can build backend services uh, using .NET Core now. So a lot of things ca has been changed uh, ever since uh, we got into Microsoft. Uh, it is also, it's for the heterogeneous teams, right? I mean, you can actually create a solution in Visual Studio for Windows. You can open the same solution on a Mac without any issues. So the same solution is going to get opened. There are a few things that won't work. For example, if you're working on a WPF app or a WinForms app and you're trying to port, uh, make it work on a Mac, that won't happen because you don't have the SDKs there. But we don't throw error, we don't open, we, we definitely open it, but there is uh, the solution, uh, you, cannot, you can edit the code, but you, you're not gonna compile it and other things. Now, the next thing is to look at the UI, right? The UI of Visual Studio of Mac is Mac. 
That's because we use the Cocoa Touch layer to build the UI. So it's a Mac app. It is not a taken from Visual Studio. But what we did is because both of these apps are written in C Sharp, we could take the entire editing features of Visual Studio onto Visual Studio for Mac. So that's the Rosalind editor, right? So many of people ask, is this a brand, you know, rebranding of Xamarin Studio? Well, part of the question is right. I mean, it is. But then the entire editor has been changed. It is sharing the code from the Visual Studio on Windows, right? So you have the great features of this ID, uh, you know, editing capabilities, code completion, refactoring, all those things have been incorporated in here. And also, we have incorporated all the web technologies like the .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, which is what you're going to look at it today as well. OK, so <clears throat> you might as well want to know how uh, Visual Studio for Mac is being architected. There is a shell layer under the hood, which is what is going to bind everything together. OK, uh, the UI is being rendered by two things. One, the Cocoa. Uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the beautiful UI that you see out there. And there is GTK as well, where we share a lot of code as well. Now, you see on the top, this Android, iOS, .NET Core, those are all like more like modular approach. So we could, whenever we wanted to replace an editor, we could just simply replace the Visual Studio's editor into this. So if you're building add-ins, you, you would want to think about this. Like this is the way it has been architected. And actually, Visual Studio for Mac is the best example to look at how do you build cross-platform applications, right? Keeping the UI intact. So a lot of you may not know this. When it was Xamarin Studio, our engineers really worked on the icons. The entire icons was redrawn. That's about 3,000 plus icons redrawn, redrawn to support retina displays on Mac. So that is the kind of effort that we put in. We follow the Apple human interface guidelines, and that is what we want you also to look at it when you're building your apps. Look at the platform, look at the, uh, what are the platform APIs, what are the platform guidelines. You want to follow that as well, right? Okay, so we're gonna look at client development first. Uh, you know, Xamarin is all for sharing a lot of C-sharp code, right? It's the entire business logic code, uh, your view models, um, yeah, or anything like a business logic, uh, anything like a view logic, you can all share it across. Now, the beauty of this is now you can actually write the UI on independent layers as well, like Android, iOS, Mac OS, TV OS, Watch OS, you name it, you, you can actually build it, everything on C-sharp. Now, I think you would have heard about Tizen as well. So you can write programs on Tizen, which eventually your programs are gonna run on refrigerators or some other devices, to toasters maybe, right? So all those things are supported. And this is predominantly what Xamarin uh, architecture is like. So you have the code behind, uh, which I mean, the, the shared code, uh, which is um, uh, shared across all the platforms. And then you have the UI layer, which is the Android, iOS, and Windows. Um, <clears throat> for a lot of you, this may not make sense, maybe, right? So you wanted to write a, a layer which is, uh, uh, can be shared across all the three platforms. So like, when, when you write an app, there are simple apps, like uh, business apps, where your UI need not be written twice in three different platforms. So that's the reason why we built Xamarin Forms. It was built by three engineers. Uh, you know, it took a lot of time initially. It was code, code named Duplo. And uh, what happened then was the idea was not to uh, you know, build a great, pla a great UI layer to replace the entire thing. The idea was to uh, help you guys build POCs really quick. Right? You don't have to spend enough time you know, building UIs and other things. So you want to build proof of concepts, or you want to build some, some really small apps. But you know, where we imagine what we want it to be to where it is now, it has changed a lot. Today, Xamarin Forms is amazing. It has great capabilities with forms uh, embedding support, now you can actually mix and match. You can actually write hybrid, uh, not exactly hybrid, the hybrid UI I was talking about. So you can actually make ha you know, a UI in your storyboard, uh, mix it with Xamarin Forms, you can integrate Xamarin Forms, you can take Forms app, integrate your native UI, and all those things. So it's amazing. Today it's, it's really a high performance platform uh, for uh, you know, writing UI very quickly. Cool, so let's get into the demo, okay? So I have more demos, so if you have questions, feel free to stop me uh, in between because, uh, because I'm going to have these projects running multiple projects, so it's going to take time uh, switching and other things, so you have time to ask questions whenever you want to. All right, so let's start off with Visual Studio. Um, so this is how a Visual Studio looks like. Is the, is the screen all right? You all can see it? Yeah? So this is Visual Studio for Mac. Uh, so just like how you do it in Visual Studio on Windows, you just go File, New Solution, and you have a lot of project templates out there. So you have multi-platform, so if you want to build on iOS, Android, 
uh, you can actually start here. Uh, but if you're just simply building an iOS app, you can start on the iOS app. And uh, it has the templates very specific to the iOS platform, uh, just like what Xcode gives. Right? Similarly, if you're building on Android, you have Android-specific layers. And uh, now you can also see something called as .NET Core, which we will go into the details a little later. So I'm going to skip this uh, for now. And I'm going to open a solution, which is uh, I just created just to save time. So <clears throat> this is an iOS project. I can go into the options, and you can see that this is an iOS project, which has, um, uh, yeah, this is a Xamarin iOS, which is targeting things, uh, Xamarin iOS. And it has iOS build, where you configure uh, you know, your linker behaviors and other things. Um, so let's actually go into the storyboard. This is where you start writing the UI. So this is the storyboard. Now if you look at the toolbox, I can actually drag and drop all the UI controls. And these UI controls are from UI kit. So it's all iOS controls, right? So you can drag and drop. Um, once you drag and drop, you can click on a view and then go into the properties um, and then edit the properties of the views and other things. So, well, <clears throat> you know, everybody is talking about augmented reality right now, right? So let's write some AR. Are you ready? Okay, excellent. So what I've done is uh, I have pre-written a code, and it's a very simple code. It's the simplest AR app you can build. Um, so I have this ship, airship, which is a 3D model, right? And uh, this is uh, a 3D model. So I'm going to integrate this into the into the AR world. Okay. So now to understand AR, you have to understand that it is the camera that's going to face the world and it is going to do a world tracking. What's a world tracking? It's about mapping real world objects into the virtual world. So your virtual world is where you create the 3D graphics and you plug them in together, okay? So what Apple did is they did an amazing job of coming out with ARKit. I mean, even before ARKit, there were AR apps, right? Pokemon Go, right? They built their own AR engines and other kind of things. But with ARKit, it is, it is really simple to do this now. For like, even you could do, maybe you have a very simple app and you want to integrate AR into it. It's very easy. All that you need to do is using ARKit, um, you put that into the namespace. And then what I've done is I have actually created a, a game view, which is nothing but uh, AR uh, scene kit view. By the way, scene kit is the 3D uh, graphic library uh, from iOS uh, that you would build 3D objects and other things. And there is sprite kit, which is a 2D uh, graphic engine. So what Apple did is they actually uh, you know, extended this so you have classes like AR scene view, uh, scene view, which you can use for you know putting the 3D objects into this real world. Okay, so <clears throat> I just initialized it. You don't have to worry about these uh, things. These are like delegates uh, in iOS. You have like events if you want to track a delegate. Um, you know, you want to track some information. You you would be thrown a delegate, and the delegate can uh, read these information. So, for example, I can go into the definition, like right click and go to declaration. Or this is one of my favorite things to do on Visual Studio for Mac. I do a command dot and I can actually search for session delegate and I can just directly navigate to that class. And it's very simple. So here's that method which is actually giving me all this tracking information. So every time a scene changes, an AR anchor changes, so I have uh, this information coming in. Right now I'm not doing anything, I'm just, just logging in to understand what's happening. Um, <clears throat> but you could do many things, right? Moving the objects and other things. Um, now I just, I just imported that scene uh, from the uh, model which is the uh, scene kit as set, so you have to make sure when you add this, it is compiling as a build action as scene kit asset. So that's how a project understands that, okay, this is a 3D model that needs to be uh, integrated into the scene kit, right? So I just set the game view scene to that scene. That's all I did right now. Now the rest of the code is what I'm gonna write. Uh, so let's start with it. <clears throat> so I'll start with game view, that's where my view is, and uh, Everything starts with a session. So it's called AR session. And once you have the hold of the AR session, you say run. So when you run it, you just have to provide the configuration. Now, when you provide the configuration, you have to provide the world tracking configuration because you are integrating the both the worlds. Right? Now, you don't have to worry if you're not understanding this right now because there is enough documentation to make you understand. And we recently had a great blog uh, where you can read about this thing. Right. Okay, so now <clears throat> how the AR works is it starts with a plane detection to understand what is the plane surface. So at the moment, Apple only supports a plane detection which is horizontal. Uh, I'm hoping that you know they will start supporting the uh, the other versions very uh, very soon. 
And you also provide a run option, which is um, you can actually restart from the previous option, uh, previous session if you had it. So, but I'm not. I'm going to just reset it, uh, which is fine. So it's going to run this now. <clears throat> Since the session is running, we need to place the object right, right? We already have this object in the scene view. So let's get that object. So I'm just going to um, start with game view dot scene dot root node dot find child nodes. Um, let's find child node. Yeah. So I'm going to say, get me this object ship. And now I have this object. <coughs> I just want to place it into its right position, right? So that takes a 3D vector graphics, so x, y, z, n. So always remember, from the point of plane detection, it is that x, y, z. So it's, it may not be the ones which you would be using as a 2D graphics, right? Uh, so I'm going to place it on my x-axis on 0 and probably uh, two points down. And I just want it a little on the distance, so I'm just going all the way up to 20f. So this should work. Uh, but to make you understand how this whole thing works, um, uh, I want to add some debug information to this view <coughs> so that you know how exactly this thing is uh, uh, you know, getting the live information. So <coughs> it is not AR. So. Ah. AR scene debug option. So I want the world origin to be shown. Um, and let's go. Also show me the feature point. So this should be good. All right. So this is something that you don't have to do it on the uh, production side. This is only to just to under get an understanding of how these things work. So now let's just run this code. So what do you think? It's going to work? Of course, right? It's going to be a demo, right? So I need to hold this right uh, so that you can see it. Um, yeah, so it's going to take a little bit of time compiling this thing. Hmm. It's deploying to device, so you can actually see all this information out here. All right, so there's a plane, right? Yeah. Thank you. So here you go. So this is the debug information I was talking about. It's the X, Y, Z, how the AR kit calculates. It's d depending on the intensity of light it receives and finds an object. And also when I'm moving it, it finds a stable object and it just places it there, right? So if I go down, you can see this feature points. That's the debug information. So you kind of get an idea about how it is being tracked, right? So let's, let's make it, uh, so right now if you see it's not moving, I, I really can't go around it because I just put a, uh, I, I, you know, I should be doing this, but I just did a, uh, you know, statically editing this position. So I'll change that and let's put in some hack. So I'm just going to copy this code and just replace this. So I go command uh, slash for building it. It's a shortcut key. By the way, all the um, shortcut keys are designed uh, for a Mac usage, but if you want to go to Visual Studio command bindings, you can go to the properties and change it too. Like if you are someone who is moving out of Windows to Mac, you can do that change. All right. So let's see how this goes. So there's an error. What happened there? This one. Yeah, copy pasting always gets into something. Okay. Do 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 do. Your questions? So I, I told you it's going to take a little bit of time. So if you have questions, I can answer them. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, um, from a summary point of view, right? So it has evolved uh, throughout the years. Now, uh, we use the same C# code base or uh, code base C# and then deploy it on 
um, deploy it on uh, Android and yep. iOS. Yep. Um, in other ecosystems, like the same Python, there's an initiative called Beware. Mm -hmm. So what they're trying to do there is you are writing Python code, and then you deploy your app in Windows as a WinForms, deploy in uh, um, uh, uh, Mac OS as a Cocoa, and then yep. deploy as Django, and like multiple environments. So in um, summary, uh, I'd like to ask if there's any initiative or plans to apart from uh, iOS and Android, uh, you can use the same uh, development approach using uh, Xamarin forms and then C yep. sharp code uh, to eventually deploy as a, as a desktop application, yep. uh, like you did the, the WP and then yep. various form factors, and then maybe eventually use the same approach XAML and C sharp to eventually deploy as a web application, maybe using WebAssembly in the future. Possible, yes. Uh, a lot of things, uh, what is going to come in the future, because it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's not on the roadmap as such, uh, but with XAML standard, which is coming in place, you're going to have a XAML across all the platforms, for sure, it's just very standard. Uh, and then uh, looking at new platforms, there is community support for Tizen, right? Similarly, it's all open source now. So we are looking at maybe a lot more other things. But today, as of today, there is like, there's no particular thing which is not supported right now. It's all there. Uh, and now with .NET Core, even to the web as well. So the web assembly, we'll have to sit and watch how that turns out to be, and then probably, yeah, should get me. Yeah, but, all right, so now you'll be wondering, where is the plane, right? Are you wondering? It is not there at all. Oh, oh, there you go. There you go, so it's flying. So I had to do a fine Pokemon Go, right? So, how is it? So I just changed a few animations. Uh, it's all from the uh, you know scene kit thing. Oh yeah, there you go. Oh, you know what? Um, <clears throat> there's another example which we ported from the Apple. So this is another yeah session. Uh, so if does anybody want to come and sit here because we can actually uh, place a chair there, right? Oh no, come on, detect a plane. <coughs> Huh. Let's undo this. Okay, let's not do. A, let's let's do a candle maybe. Unless, yeah. Oh, there you go. So you can see that. So I can actually literally place it uh, on my table right here. So you just see that. That's cool, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't like this, so let's try this, uh, maybe a ways, right? Oh yeah, this is looking nice, right? <laughs> so guys, we can do this all day, all right? We can do this all day. This is like, oh yeah, this lamp, this beautiful lamp that I can place it here, right? So you see how amazing the future is and how much of, as a .NET developer, you have accessibility to all, the, all these things. <coughs> okay, let's leave that. Cool, right? Okay, so let's move on. So that was about iOS. I wanted to show you the native capabilities, what you could do with iOS. Now let's move on to something like Android, right? So you can create a new Android project from file, new, uh, new solution, uh, go to the Android project and choose an app that you want to write. Um, or you, you may want to write a library and then share it with other people. You can do that too. Okay, so I have already created it. So let's go into that project real quick. Um, so I have the resources, so I have the designer here, right here. So you see that you saw the designer which was very much for the iOS. Now see the designer for Android, it is all supporting the existing Android XML layout, right? So you can actually technically copy paste the code from the Android XML and then put it here, it's gonna just work. But that's not the idea, right? The designer is amazing, so you can actually drag and drop, play around. Uh, okay, let me do this. So if you wanna change the surface, let's say if I wanna see how this thing looks on six or some other device like Pixel C, so you can see that. Now, everybody in Android talk about material design, right? Just like Apple has human interface guidelines, uh, Google provides you with some user interface guidelines, and they suggest that you, know, you go with some kind of a theme with material design. So you can change those themes right here, but let's go create this theme. So we made it incredibly easy for you to start with material design. So I can go into the material palette, uh, I don't know if you have done this in the past. When I have to build an Android application, I have to follow the material design. I go to a material website and find out these colors and then copy and paste it here, right? Now this is even more easier. So I can now choose my background to be, let's say, <clears throat> I wanna choose this, 
uh, no, that's, let's, let's just white here, right? Um, uh, let's, let's just leave that and go into the uh, primary color material palette and then change that, okay? Dark, go to the material palette and change to a darker version. Um, and I can go and change the accent like this. Go and go to the button color and change to the same accent. So you can actually change all these things here and you can create this new theme and apply across all your things. So it, we made it very easy for you to design it right here. I mean, most of the developers are not designers, but, so, but at least we can get you tools to make it easy for you to you know, save yourself. <laughs> Okay, so that was Android. <clears throat> so let's move on. So I talked about client development. There's one part of the client development that is missing, uh, which is you can also build the Xamarin Mac apps. Let's say if you want to build something like a Visual Studio for Mac, uh, right inside Mac, you can do that too. So I'm going to show you an app uh, which was built by one of my colleagues, uh, which is called the Kimono Designer. It is also open source. So you can take a look at it, how this has been architect. So you, have, so you can see there's kind of multiple platforms uh, and there is Xamarin Mac out here. So I'm going to run this very straightforward. And uh, I'll show you what it is. So there you go. It just runs. So now you see this is a, uh, this is a designer for Skia shop. You guys know Skia? So Skia is a Google, uh, Google's library, 2D graphics library, which has been used both in Google Chrome as well as in Android. Uh, and many other places. Now, Skia, with Skia Sharp, actually, you, you, can, you can write code into iOS, Android, and Windows and things. So anyways, so this is the IDE that was built using Xamarin Mac. So I can drag and drop, let's say, like, how many of you developers who can design really well? Anybody? Oh, no, yeah. Yeah, you're with me. So yeah, there you go. So you can drag and drop, and you can see that there, the code that is being generated, that is, um, that is C Sharp. So you can actually literally copy and paste this code into your application to create the 2D graphics. Isn't it amazing? So <clears throat> this is all done in Xamarin Mac. So you can, you can actually spend all your day. It's like Photoshop. It's, you can keep doing stuff. It's, yeah, it's nice. So you, you see that just color changes and other things, right? OK, cool. So let's get on with that. I talked about uh, Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, Xamarin Mac apps. Now let's go into a few other things. Uh, you won't ignore this change, like building server applications. Now, <clears throat> every um, every mobile app uh, it requires a mobile backend, right? Do you agree? Otherwise, you're building calculators, correct? So if you need a mobile app, wouldn't it be nice to have an easier way to get started with it? So you can do that. You can go find new solution. Go to multi-platform, choose a forms app for you, or, or a blank forms app, or, or, or sorry, or your native app. It's fine. Choose whatever template works for you, and you can actually check this box called mobile backend. And what this is going to do is it's going to add a .NET Core project to your solution, which is going to be your backend, which is all wired up for you. So you just have to go and edit the code. Now let's look at that feature. So I go into the Visual Studio solution. Uh, I have already created this. I, I did not do anything. It's just file new and then I have a mobile backend out here. Okay, there's absolutely nothing. So this is, if you go into the project properties, um, go into the general and you can see that it is supporting .NET Core 2.0, right? So you're right now building .NET Core web applications right inside a Mac. So let's start running this, right? So I'm going to run this on a simulator. So let's leave. OK, it's going to take some time building. So yeah, <clears throat> so mobile backend, um, uh, you know, you can actually right click and publish directly to Azure as well. I mean, probably you are doing this on Windows already. So we got that same, you know, same features and same support added to the Visual Studio for Mac. Um, are we done? No. Yeah, any questions until then? Oh, no. No, sorry, it just works. So you can see that it's been getting installed, right? And you will also see is that a Safari opened with a backend, right? So that's a swagger. I don't know if you noticed something. Did you notice something? It is, you're debugging two applications at once. So we support multi-process debugging right now. So, 
So I'll show you how this thing works. So let's say if I want to know what is inside this, so I have some three fields, um, data with item description. So you can see that I have the same thing, item one, two, three. So let's go and add this thing. So I'll call this as item four, very handy name. And I click save, and I can see that I'm on the item view model, which is a UI. So I have the same things out here. And I go, you know, run this again, and you can see that now I'm hitting the breakpoint on the web side of things, right? So it is in, within the same debugging, uh, you get the same experience as if you know you are going end to end all the way, all right? Okay, now if you want to go ahead and take this to the web uh, and publish it, you can just simply go ahead and say right click publish and you have this feature called publish to Azure um, where it'll query all your subscriptions, add your, um, to, uh, okay, maybe my this one's, End it. So I, I'll just leave that. So um, yeah, you can add those subscriptions and you can choose uh, what plan you want to and then publish it directly. Okay, once you do that, the other thing that you want, want to do is go into the app.xaml in this case uh, and you change that backend URL to the URL that has been published out there, yeah? Okay, so that was the mobile backend which was very, very uh, simple, right? Um, okay, now, Let's let's go ahead and do something else. Yeah. Uh, on the debug menu, you've got uh, the multi process. Yeah. And beside that, you've got the. Uh, okay. How do you? Sell? Okay. Yeah. I, I know your confusion. So, <clears throat> so he's asking, how do you do multi processing? It's very simple. You go to the solution, um, pick the options. Okay. You have run configurations, right? Now you can create run configuration, like for, uh, run both maybe. And then here, uh, once it's saved, you can actually choose how many projects you want to run. Yeah? Questions answered? Okay. Cool. All right. So I, and now you can also, when you do the multiprocess, you can also select, like, for example, in this, in iOS, what simulator you want to select. And then in case of mobile web service, obviously, the Safari is going to open, right? Okay. So <clears throat> that was mobile backend. Now let's go ahead. And you saw that we support .NET Core. Uh, we also support is the .NET standard library. So you can go create a .NET standard library right inside here and uh, choose, where is it? Sorry? Sorry? Okay, yeah. So that you can you can actually select the .NET standard library, uh, which is great. I mean, it is the newest form of uh, sharing a code, right? And the previously we had PCL. Uh, you can think of .NET standard as a better implementation of uh, PCL because .NET standard is literally a spec document which tells everyone to implement these 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 APIs, right? So everyone implements that. So when you write a code inside the .NET standard, you can be sure that that's going to work on every single platform. All the issues that you face with the you know profilings and other things with PCL, that's all gone. So it's all standardized right now <clears throat> so you can go and let's go and create something so i go I've called it as some some to do dot shared and uh, it's going to create uh, the project and what you're going to see is just a simple class file uh, which you can actually now reference into your ios and android projects so i can simply go and say edit reference add uh, project and uh, i'm going to select the shared and similarly I'm going to do that on Android as well because I'm right now when I'm cre I created I created a shared project right here. So uh, you need to reference uh, all your packages into the original projects which is being referenced. So I'm going to do that. So that's done. And now I'm going to add some code here so that we can start using something, right? So I'm going to pick up a file that I created already. Uh, probably it's there somewhere here. Yeah. So I just created something called as a translator service, which is basically takes a text and translates into a language that you want to, uh, you know, see. So I'm using the cognitive services. Okay, um, this is the API for the cognitive services, and I'm actually taking a text and I'm translating to the language that I want to. Okay, it's very straightforward. So it's just a simple method called translate text, and then uh, the language code and you provide the secret key. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing. You see that HTTP client and uh, X document. Now, I did not add any other references to no NuGet packages, nothing that is referenced, because it's going to work straight out of the box. 
that's the beauty of .NET standard, right? So now I'm going to just build this um, iOS maybe. And then I will go into one of my views. Uh, <coughs> so it's in the about page where I want to use this translated text. So let's do that. So I have created a label called translated text. Um, so it's, it's an async method. So I need to make it a sync, maybe. Yeah, this should let the error go away. <coughs> Oh, did the wrong method. Sorry, wrong command. Okay, so now we're good. And let's run this on the iOS. So for this, I'm just going to simply start the iOS profile and then ship it up. Because I, I, I really didn't want the this one. So. Did I just lose a semicolon here? Should work. Da, da, da. What? Curly braces is missing. This one. Oh. And oh. What? Remove the selector. From where? Yeah, from there. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. It's not using its name space. Right, right. Thank you. See, that's why, that's why it's good to be among the developers, because we can all debug together. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the sum to do. And uh, yeah, I just implemented the about page. So I'm going to just click on the translate. And let's see if this works. Oh, there you go. It comes from the cognitive services, right? Oh, look at that. They, uh, they didn't translate Xamarin. They didn't translate iOS. They didn't translate Windows, but they translated Android. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. OK, so that was uh, .NET Share, .NET Core, and uh, you saw mobile backend. Now let's shift gears and uh, build some web applications, right? So I go, how do you create a web application? I'll go create file new solution, uh, go to the .NET Core app, and I can choose between the web app and web API app. Web API app is the defaulted ones, which you got in the mobile backend. But right now, I'm going to go into the web app and create next. And uh, you can see that. That's a .NET Core 2.0. And go next. And then I say, hello, web code, maybe. I hope I have not created that project before. So I'm just going to create that project and uh, write some HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, which is so not usual writing Xamarin, right? OK, so there you go. So this is all your .NET Core web projects. So uh, we can go into the views if you want to see the HTML, which is the good HTML to see. Yeah, this one, right? So you can actually edit this thing. So you have IntelliSense support right baked into it. Uh, it has great IntelliSense support for CSS, JavaScript, um, and uh, where's CSS? Yeah, the CSS here. So if you want to edit the CSS, so right now it is context aware, so it is it can actually tell you predict what you can you want to write it here inside. Uh, so you have all those IntelliSense baked in. Um, and it also has a great support for JSON. So for example, if I want to add an author information, uh, for example, it's, there's no reference here, right? So I can just say author, and you can see that the IntelliSense just comes up because it knows that you're editing the power.json where you would be writing something like this. So you have some really nice thing like this, right? So I can just add that, and you're all done. Now, <clears throat> I can build this solution right here, and you're going to see it anyways, right, on the Safari. But let's do something else. Let's go ahead and add a Docker support. So now there is a support for Docker as well on Visual Studio for Mac. Okay? Remember, this is a preview feature. Okay? It's only available on your preview channels, which is uh, your stable, sorry, if you see your alpha and beta. So I just created it, and I'm just going to simply run this, nothing else. Yeah? Okay. So what is going to happen is I just want to make sure that my Docker is running. Yes, it is. So it should be all good. And uh, let's, let's go to the uh, controllers, some controller. 
and let's um, put a break point here. Okay, so now you see that uh, usually um, you know ASP.NET Web Applications opens on 5001. Now that's open on 32769. Let's let's confirm this is Docker. Let's confirm. You know, maybe it's not Docker, right? Maybe. So I just say Docker list my containers, and now you can see that it is the same port, right? That you saw. So <clears throat> now I can go into the about page and uh, where's my Visual Studio? There you go, it got connected. So now you can, containerization is so magically supported on Visual Studio for Mac, okay? Great. So we're good. Let's stop this. Let's switch gears. Now what else will you build for web, right? What else will you build? you can actually go into the cloud and build for Azure Functions. It's again another previous feature that is being supported. So I have actually built it right here. It's very simple, it's very straightforward. Um, it is much more useful than now with mobile apps. You can actually have microservices running everywhere. So I just created a simple function, uh, which is a HTTP trigger function, which is gonna do int x and y. It's gonna one plus two is gonna three. So I'm just simply gonna um, so I did not do any magic. I just created a new class and I just pasted this code from the uh, documentation which is available on the docs.microsoft.com. And when I run this, you can actually see that there is this beautiful Azure Functions logo that comes up in the console screen, right? And, and then uh, you are actually want to know which port it opened and it's listening on. So this is the one, this is where it is, it is opened up. So I can go into my browser and I can hit that port and it's running. So now let's see if that uh, function is working. So API add, there you go. That's the thing, right? So now function is running locally. You can right click and publish to Azure and uh, make your stuff work. Isn't it cool? Yeah? yeah? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's get back to the slides. So <clears throat> we saw um, server development. Uh, you saw the client development, iOS, Android, Mac. Uh, you saw server development on C Sharp. Um, so we support .NET Core right away. And uh, the other features that I showed you were the Docker, which is, uh, which is a preview feature, okay? and functions. Both of them are preview features. Now next up is a lot of people prefer game development in C Sharp. I'm not sure if you know about Unity, right? Unity by default supports C Sharp. What we did right now is now you can take that C Sharp and put it into your Visual Studio of Mac. We have made an easy integration into it. You can actually compile and debug that C Sharp, the Unity C Sharp, uh, using Visual Studio for Mac. And we made it seamlessly. Uh, and, and it's very simple to use that. You also saw Skia, right? I talked about this. We started supporting Skia, uh, Skia as well. It's the port of uh, the original Skia library. It's called Skia Sharp. Uh, so it's a great 2D graphics engine if you are building some 2D stuff. Uh, feel free to go and use this. This is greatly supported by the community as well. Um, so, <clears throat> and we also support Urho Sharp. Okay, Urho is again a 3D engine, um, and it is which is great. Now, the best thing about Urho is that you know Urho can be mixed with AR as well. So Urho supports AR. So if you don't want to write this AR sessions in Kira things, you can preferably use Urho, which is eventually can you know make you can make it work on the Hololens, uh, just like probably you would have seen one of the demos from the speakers here. Um, so you can actually do, this is Urho Sharp running on HoloLens. And uh, similarly, this is a port of the same Urho Sharp which is running on the HoloLens in using ARKit, right? We just picked up that and put it in, compile, boom, that's, there's an ARKit stuff. Isn't it so cool? All right, so well, let's talk about Visual Studio Mac previews. I talked about the Docker support, which has already come in. Uh, we talked about the Azure Functions which is already common. What we haven't spoken is about the IoT. We also support uh, IoT development on Visual Studio for Mac. So it's called Xamarin IoT. Um, so by default, it comes with these message queues, suppose MQTT and AMQP. Um, and you can actually, we also have brilliant libraries to connect to Azure IoT Hub. So what you have right now is you have to switch to the alpha channel and you also have to put in a small plug add-in uh, to your Visual Studio for Mac and you have your IoT covered. It can work on any Linux distribution, right? Raspbian by default, uh, so you don't have to install anything else. It just straightforward works. And uh, you can compile, debug, um, 
uh, you know, those devices. Um, and uh, it supports just like how you do Visual Studio uh, from Windows, how do you do the iOS deployment? You can do the same deployment from Mac. Uh, it, there, you just have to connect to the IP address of the Raspberry, where you open the SSH, and then you can do remote deployment and debug this whole application. I wish I could show that today, but uh, apparently I didn't carry the uh, IoT kit, so <clears throat> I'm just going to skip that. The next chap, um, I want to talk to you about the Live Player. Have you guys heard about Live Player, which we announced? In? Yeah, OK. So let's look at the Live Player. And this is when I need Ben. Where's Ben? <laughs> he just walked out. OK. It's fine. So let's go into the Live Player. Uh, it's nothing. I just created a simple sample. Uh, I'll just show you some things really quickly. Um, so this is a project. Uh, I need to, uh, OK, the reason why I need Ben is because I need this iPhone for the hotspot. Uh, because I'm using the Microsoft Corp network on my Mac. Yeah, Any, uh, yeah I actually, I connected to his. Phone, phone, phone. So yeah, yeah, we don't need you. We need your phone. <laughs> Uh, I'll up in very quickly. Yeah, that's what, yep. I can sing your song in the meantime. Hold on. Yeah. Right. So my device is all connected to MSFT Guest, and MSFT Guest is a secured network where you cannot tra you know, transact between two devices. So I needed some open Wi-Fi. Super fruit. Oh, that's just going to connect, right? I guess we tried it yesterday. Yep. It should be good. Lens iPhone, yeah. Yep. I think we're good. Are we good? Excellent. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. Okay, so that's my my personal device. So I'm just going to show you on this because I did not configure this. Uh, so let's do, go ahead and do that. <clears throat> so I can go into the live player. You can see Xamarin live player. So you get this QR code. It's very simple. Um, what I need to do is I need to open my my <laughs> Live player app, and you may not see this. Bear again. And oh, there you go. It was too fast, right? It just came up and just went. Yeah, so that's iPhone 7. So it's now configured. We're good. So now I can just choose iPhone 7 player and directly deploy this application. So I'm going to do that. <coughs> So <clears throat> Live Player is an amazing thing. Uh, you say that, it was very quick actually, right? So you have this app. So the reason why I wanted to show you on the hotspot is because uh, I'm not connected. And I'm actually, I can actually go ahead and debug this application right away. Uh, but instead of debugging this application, it wouldn't it be cool to show you something much more uh, awesome, which is live editing. So I can just go and say, um, in my debug configuration, uh, live run current view. Now you see that it is almost immediate. So let's just move this thing a little bit, right? So now I can go ahead and uh, change this color. I hate this color. That's it. This is beautiful color, right? So I changed it to red. <clears throat> is that that's immediate? Not even connected, right? Yeah. Let's change few more stuffs. What do we change? Obviously the colors, right? So you see that IntelliSense, which comes up very cool. Uh, so we just change the foreground color of what? I have no idea. Oh, this one, 1.0. Uh, and we can go ahead and change colors for the button, right? Maybe yellow. Yeah. Now we, we made a beautiful looking app, which was ugly earlier. <laughs> right? so, <clears throat> so that was cool. So the thing is, uh, now you can actually take up your Windows machine, connect to the same live player, and work on an iOS device without having a Mac. I might get into trouble for this, right? So I want to make this very, very clear. It's not we are, we are not turning away the Mac. Mac is obviously needed for all your compilations and building and other things. What we're trying to do here is a live player is a simple app which is running the Roslyn compiler inside it. So it's taking your part of the code and it is compiling inside itself. Got it? So it's Roslyn running inside this app. And it is beautiful. It's amazing how this technology works. It's almost immediate. So this is even cooler when you, when you I mean, you're, you're all developers. And, and how much time does it take to edit one document, build it, compile? You saw that I, I was doing all this while, right? 
because I couldn't get to this, so you know the pain, what, how, you know, where you build and debug and other kind of things. Now it's super simple and super easy to do this, right? It's not only this, you can actually write a lot of code, like not just the UI, you can actually write, um, you know, code behind, add uh, stuff, you can, everything is gonna work very seamlessly. All right, was it cool? Oh. That's great, that's great. <clears throat> Okay, so how many of you have developed iOS application in the past? <coughs> yeah, how many of you have shipped it to the store? And how painful was that? <laughs> yeah, okay, to show you that, uh, maybe I'll just, uh, let's, let's take the same live player maybe. Right. So let's say if I want to deploy this to my device, which is again, um, yeah, it's, it's connected here, so let's, let's try to deploy this, right? <laughs> So I'm just going to pick up my live player iOS and I'm just going to say start, oh yeah, and then I'm just going to choose my, not the live player, I want the real device right now, I mean connected device, and I'm just going to say click the build, right? So we are, we are developers and it's like, hey, I didn't write a code, and oh yeah, there you go. There's a build error, right? And how many of you have seen this? There's something that says no install provisioning profile, right? How do you fix this error? Oh my god, how do you fix this error? Yeah? You know what I do when I get into errors? I do this. What the hell is a provisioning profile? Right? And then there is a there is an there's an Apple documentation which is amazing. So so then I just like, oh that is a provisioning profile, and then I just go read, 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 read. And read and read, 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 read. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh that's provisioning profile, right? And then you say like, oh wait a minute, I'm building Xamarin applications, right? Even though you can follow this documentation, I want to know how do you do it in Visual Studio for Mac, right? So I just do Xamarin and then say provisioning profile, right? Is that what we do? I don't know. I do this all the time. Uh, and then, 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this device provisioning, there's a, there's, a, there's a link, oh yeah, yeah, this is what I wanted. And then it's like, oh wow, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh yeah, it's crazy. Right? I have no idea what provisioning profile is. Now, <clears throat> if you know what provisioning profile is, basically Apple has secured uh, in a way that you know you cannot uh, like ship some ad hoc apps into uh, anyway. So you have to go to the developer dot uh, apple dot com, get a provisioning profile, get your certificates registered first. So I'll show you that thing. Um, you just go into the certificates, IDs, and profiles. Uh, you have to be part of the team or you're, a, you're an independent developer. You do all these kind of things, crazy things. Uh, add certificate, go in to say that, okay, this is the device I want to deploy, blah, 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 right? So now, we made it much, 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 much easier. So you go to the options and you select a team right here, okay? And, uh, and now you select a signing identity after, right after that. Um, which is my MacBook, which is going to sign this thing. And now I just want to create a provisioning profile, right? And hopefully, after it rotates completely, again and again and again, it is going to create a provisioning profile and put it right here. So I can just now click OK and then just simply say run. Right? Cool? It's going to work. You can clap. Yeah. So it's basically we started supporting the fast lane tools. So now even for distribution and other things, you can just don't do not worry about the documentation. Obviously, you need to know. Yeah. Uh, but then yeah, you can use these tools to just get started very quickly. Okay. So should we wait for this to deploy? Should we move on? Does work on uh, the call center? Was it? So, no, the first lane is basically on the Visual Studio for Mac right now. Um, I don't know, you should have asked yesterday whether they are going to support that. So, fast lane is a separate tools tool set, which it has been getting integrated into the Visual Studio for Mac. So, you have to install fast lane to make this work. But it would create a certificate somewhere. Yeah. You could. 
using you mean, you mean using the provisioning profile that was created yeah. yeah yeah of course you can it is so when i'm doing this it is actually creating on the website if you go into my that's not that's not my question okay like when you use the fast lane mm -hmm. it creates a certificate somewhere that on uh, the hard drive right? mm -hmm. can we use that certificate mm -hmm. and upload it to the mobile center you could and use it over there you could yeah. why not it's the same process right i mean if it's creating the certificate the way you create it there you could do that uh, yes. Ah, my device is not. Clean. Oh, anyways, let's let's move on. So, <clears throat> okay, so that was uh, the demo on the live player. We also looked at Fastlane. Uh, this is definitely your friend on the iOS. On my iPad Pro, 546, oh, I don't know what Siri is doing. All right, so now next up um, is .NET in every program. I mean, uh, many of us are very, very lucky to be building applications on .NET, use C Sharp, beautiful language, .NET framework, use some amazing features like Link and other things. But uh, there are some of us uh, who are not that lucky, right? They write programs in Objective-C and Java and other worlds for sure, right? Uh, so what would you do if you, or maybe you know, your, your manager came to you and said like, hey, you know what, I want you to develop this on Java. I want you to develop this on Objective-C. And this, you have this huge bunch of love for C-sharp and you have a code for it. And what if you want to integrate that code inside your Java application or your Objective-C application? Wouldn't it be nice to reuse that same .NET into the iOS and Android projects or any other frameworks, for example, right? Wouldn't it be nice? So what we did is um, Miguel came out with this called Embedinator 4000. Really, guys, that's the name, okay? 4000 is still there on the number. So this is, you can imagine itself like, it is like a messiah for all this .NET from the .NET uh, guys, uh, you know, to save you uh, from, uh, you know, from writing some crazy stuff. So <clears throat> it is basically, um, you know, use your existing code bases on Objective-C. You guys know, probably know, you know, attended a session yesterday called Bindings where you bring the Java libraries to .NET. Um, this is the other way around. You can take your .NET libraries to anywhere in the world. Okay, any other program. So Objective-C, Java, Swift, and C++ right now. And um, <clears throat> what, uh, you, what it does is it actually turns this library uh, using some APIs. Um, so it supports like Android, iOS, Mac OS, you know, any desktop Java, Unix, Windows, all the worlds. Um, you know, Java jars and iOS frameworks, they all can live together. Uh, and also, you can consume from any other languages as well. So let's look at that. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to open uh, the Visual Studio uh, for Mac and open a, a Xamarin project called Weather, which is all written in C Sharp. So this is all the C Sharp logic. So there is a shared C Sharp DLL, which is uh, basically doing the HTTP client, fetching the weather information, uh, and it's going to give you a result, right? So now, when I'm going to build this, watch this. What it's going to do is it's actually going to build uh, a binding um, uh, for the other languages. So you can see that uh, external tool was called and this is going to take some time. So it is going to write those uh, stuffs in. So, so you can see that there is a weather.a created, that's the iOS. Um, there is the, uh, you know, there's the Java code as well, which it gets called. I'm creating the Java file. And eventually what it does, what this tool does is once, once this is completed, uh, it is going to put all the frameworks out there so I go into the folder, and it is going to have all these, um, uh, you know, libraries with .h and .a uh, stuff out here. Now you can actually open Xcode, which I hate doing it right now. So I'm so used to Visual Studio. So I can open this, and I can actually reference the weather.ios framework, which I just created. Right? It's very straightforward. And now, once it is done, I can write some code. So this is the code. Uh, let me just. Zoom it a little bit. Yeah. So this is the code. So just like you know, C sharp was much easier. Equals new, new X weather, blah 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 stuff. Uh, Objective C does it in a very different way. So you ein it. So you can see how the even the uh, namings have been matched uh, to the Objective C paradigm. Uh, so it does that very very nicely. And then all that you need to do is just say run, and it is going to install. Now what's happening is it's installing an iOS Objective C app and it is running your c sharp code right inside it yeah so let's see uh, 
Um, so there you go. So there's a city state. So let's go. Um, uh, oh yeah, there you go. Because the text box is created without any borders, I can't find where that is. So let's let's see uh, what's the city weather in SF, my favorite city. So there you go. So you get this information. Now this whole thing is coming from the .NET DLL, which was created, right? Isn't it awesome? Yeah. So I'll, I just mind you, this is for this is for the awesomeness for all those people who are not lucky, right? <coughs> for you, you can always do it on .NET. Okay, so. <clears throat> Cool. How much time do I have? How much? 20 minutes? Oh, that's a lot of time, actually. I'll take a go. <laughs> sure. So that was a demo on Embedinator. And this is how you install. When you install it, make sure you select .NET Core. And uh, Workbooks and Inspector also is amazing. Um, so once you install, uh, go ahead and give it a try. Actually, I'm almost done. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, we can take them. Uh, while you ask the questions, I'm going to put this slide. This is from Microsoft Singapore. They are hiring. <laughs> so if anyone wants to apply for a TSP position on Xamarin, right? Is that TSP? Technical sales. Technical sales, yeah. So if anyone is interested, you can do that. OK, so questions. <coughs> yep. What's the uh, feature parity between uh, Xcode uh, Interface Builder and uh, Microsoft Visual Studio on the iOS side? Uh, when you say feature code parity, it's not the ID side of things. It's the uh, when you do the layout, like when you define in Xcode, you define all the constraints and everything that. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, do you have all those features? Yes, in we we have all those features like adding constraints and other things in in Visual Studio. Uh, but the way you use it is slightly different. For example, it's from mostly from the Visual Studio world of Windows, where you have toolboxes, you have properties, uh, and constraints are right inside the designer. You click on it, and uh, you know you add constraints on the you know things. And then obviously there's no control click, there's no function click. <laughs> we don't have any of those things. Yeah, we don't have those things. Uh, but it's more from the .NET developer how would he he design on this? It's more from that thing. But you have every feature supported in a way a .NET developer would approach it. Yeah. Uh, is there a similar thing to IARP on, on Samarin Android? Samarin Android? It's yeah. AR Core. Yes, it's there. AR Core. Yeah. It's from Google, so that's a binding. There's a binding. Does Live Player support on uh, Visual Studio on Windows? It does, yes. Okay. And the same way. Uh, like the changing the attribute uh, real time change on the live layer. Yes. So suppose uh, we added some stack layout or some label, then also uh, it reflects same time. Yes, it does. Okay. It does do that. It also you can actually write code behind, right click event handlers. You can do all of those things. It so basically the way you have to look at it, it's a C sharp compiler running inside. So you can actually technically throw any C sharp at it, and it's going to do that. No questions. Yeah. So I'll go, uh, uh, we've shown the embedded anchor, right? But that's from uh, C Sharp to other platforms. Let's say I want to solely develop in the C Sharp in summary. Uh, do you know of any other tool that converts maybe from Java to? Oh, yeah, you, you actually missed the session yesterday from Sushi, which was. Because a... that is like, uh, you have to manually do it, right? And there are like lots of considerations. But if you have like embedded, embedded anchor tool that can sort of seamlessly just run from it, you <laughs> it from C Sharp. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> see, I'll tell you what. Uh, there are Android JAR libraries which are straightforward as well. You can just put it and just say compile and it just works. Okay? Uh, the manually, why you saw a lot of edits is because both the, both the technologies, both the languages are very different from each other. Right? There are types which are different. You have to do a mapping. So there are times when the tools will fail. Even Embedinator can fail at a certain point where it cannot. So you manually edit that thing and then you move forward. Yep? Yep. Yeah, hi. Is hi. there any hopes of ever getting an X64 assembly level debugger, maybe, in Visual Studio? 
So I mean like uh, basically just uh, put in executables and see how exactly uh, deep down into the processor instruction level uh, how far it goes. I have no idea about it right now. I can check with the team and let you know later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No questions. All right. Thank you so much.